and we can come back to this part and decide whether we should amend the definition. Yes, that's one way to go by it. I'm the last one to speak. Is it for the government to define what an international organization is, or has the government made reference to other uh, legal tools? Law drafting. We made reference to the copyright ordinance, CAP 198 or Section 198. Members apparently are concerned about A, and in fact, this is uh, copied from the copyright ordinance, right? So, so you've made reference to local legislation, Mr. Chan Siu Hong. Yes, I agree with Deputy Secretary. Well, if we consider the definition of international organization in isolation, we are depriving ourselves of the context and the scenario of how this is used. So perhaps we should go to the actual relevant provisions to consider the whole context. Perhaps this term it can be found in many other provisions, hence the interpretation here. So depending on the context, the term may not be one of international organization at all. So I do agree with the Deputy Secretary. When we come to part six about the definition of an external um, force or external organization, uh, we can then give it a thought. Yes, I subscribe to the view of Mr. Chan. We should not in any way paint this term international organization in a bad light. This is not what we intend to do. So how about you provide the definition in the actual provisions where this is to be applied for a better understanding of what it means. Well, for those who are well versed with the law, they may easily understand what this is about. Otherwise, it's prone to misunderstanding. So please, um, you can put it on hold put it aside and then we'll go to the actual provisions and by then when we have a clearer idea we can then make this decision oh. deputy secretary please continue moving on we come to the term external place this means a region or place outside the hksar other than the mainland and macau this term will also come up frequently in the bill. Sometimes it's in the context of external organizations. And then it's also used in other contexts, such as external forces. So let's first focus on external place. Mr. Chen Xiu Hong. Now, external place. Is there particular reason for the use of the word place in English. The interpretation says it's other than the mainland and Macau. But what if you have a scenario, a body is set up in Macau, and then this body is in breach of Hong Kong's laws. It's outside Hong Kong. But if we want to invoke this law, we cannot go after that body. Do we have other laws to deal with this scenario? Is that why we exclude the mainland and Macau for the meaning of the term external place in this bill? Deputy Secretary. For this bill, there's a key concept. It's a distinction between the mainland and the external place. 
the concept here is whether something happens in Hong Kong, it's in the mainland, or is it in an external place? When something is committed by someone in an external place, there's a greater impact on Hong Kong. So this goes beyond just the coverage. The question is whether the crime is committed by someone in an external place with a bearing on our national security. When we phrase external place and define external place like this, we can better reflect our policy intent. But you exclude Macau, why? One more comment. This was also mentioned by my colleague Article 29 of the National Security Law. Collusion with foreign or external forces to endanger national security. So we have made reference to Article 29 of the National Security Law. You don't see the distinction in the Chinese text, but when you, once you refer to the English text of Article 29 of the NSL, by external, you have what you see here in the bill. It's outside Hong Kong, but excludes the mainland and Macau. So we have adopted the phrasing, the concept from Article 29 of the NSL. Of course, the offense will be different in this bill, but the concept, the principle is the same in this bill and in the NSL, Mr. Chen Xiu Hong. I see this concept is also in the NSL. But now coming back to the safeguarding national security bill, what if you have a case? It involves external bodies. Some people in that body does something to harm our national security. But then here the definition excludes the mainland and Hong Kong and Macau. So we cannot invoke this law to go after those culprits and gather evidence because we are excluding the mainland and Macau. It's the reason for doing this that we have other laws in Hong Kong to deal with that so that we don't end up having to rely on Macau's national security law to go after those culprits. Mr. Simon Wong. Now, external place as a concept matters because it's related to external force. And by external force, it's in the context of collusion with external forces. In those cases, stiffer penalties will apply. When a body in Macau does something to harm national security, this body will be held criminally liable if an offense has a territorial effect and depending on the scope of the territorial effect, that body will be caught by the law. We exclude Macau from the concept of the external place. Simply when it comes to sentencing and whether stiffer penalties arise, but that does not grant immunity when a body in Macau commits a national security offense, Ms. Kamen Khan. I have a question. Do we need to define the mainland? CAP 635, 645, those two ordinances, CAP 639 and 645, those two ordinances do have a definition for the mainland. So I'm wondering if we should do the same in this bill. Mr. Chen Siu Hong's question just then was about excluding Macau. Now on external force, which we will come to shortly. So Macau is excluded and that will have a bearing on how we read external forces.
So as the government just said, when someone tries to hurt our national security from a cow, can we catch that body as well? And that's the question of Mr. Chen Xiu Hong. So we can revisit that point in a moment. But let me first raise this question. Should we define the mainland in this bill? Deputy Secretary. So the everyday understanding will do because this does not seem like a drafting issue, but more like a policy issue. Do we need to define the mainland? The ordinary meaning is easy enough to follow. The meaning of the mainland is clear and plain, and it's also in line with that in the NSL. The NSL has similar provisions. So we believe we don't need the definition to make the term the mainland clear. But the NSL is different from the Safeguarding National Security Bill. The NSL is a national law. Shouldn't there be a distinction in our approach to? Now, the two laws have to be compatible. Article 29 of the NSL simply refers to the mainland. The NSL and this bill are supposed to be compatible, but the NSL is a national law. We all know that. But here, this bill will be a local law. The local law will apply to just Hong Kong, but not to the rest of China or places like Macau. So it's a different approach warranted in terms of definition. We will look into that after the meeting to see if we need to do anything about that. Mr. Kitson Yang. Now, for the term external place, we will take that to mean places outside the HKSAR. Why exclude the mainland? Why narrow down the meaning? External place is closely linked to external forces. And external forces have to do with foreign governments. And why leave out the meaning, the part about foreign countries? Deputy Secretary, we don't make specific references to foreign governments. Region, place, these terms are broad enough. So we don't refer to foreign countries in particular. Mr. Kitson Yang, we mean when we mean region as part of a country. So this means a country seems excluded. That doesn't add up. I don't quite follow the government's response. Deputy Secretary, I'm positive that the phrasing we have now can cover what we want. There is no need to add the word term country under this term. Mr. Llewellyn let me try to address Mr. Yang's question. Now, the term external place. We are based in the HKSAR. So an external place is anywhere that is outside the HKSAR. As my other colleagues have explained, it's a place outside the HKSAR. But let's not forget the bracket we're leaving out the mainland and Macau. We need to align our approach with that under the NSL, and that's all there is. We're based in Hong Kong. We're talking about external place in the sense of anywhere that is outside the HKSAR. But to align our approach with that under the NSL, we exclude the mainland and Macau. So that's how it works. Read in that light, this phrase can cover other countries other than our country. I hope this helps. You can think it through. I can see you're kind of puzzled. 
Miss Daphne Seal. We're drafting this bill in Hong Kong, so we take a Hong Kong centric approach. Since we're starting from the HKSL, it would be strange to talk about countries outside the HKSL. It's fine to talk about countries outside the PLC, but it would be odd to talk about countries outside the HKSL. You still have time left, Mr. Kits and Yang. There's a bracket. It says, other than the mainland and Macau. So we're saying outside Hong Kong, so it's fine when you include countries under that heading. Acting law officer, Ms. Stephanie Sue. We do not mention the HKJSAL in a country in the same breath. So we phrase it as region. Stephanie's point is this, the HKSL is not a country. When you say a country outside the HKSL, that will give rise to misunderstanding that someone may suspect that the HKSL is a country. So let's use a neutral term, place. A place can cover a country or any sub-national region. That will help dispel the misconception. So that's just about the phrasing. Thank you, Mr. Holden Chow. Thank you, Chairman. My question is about the phrasing, external place. When I first got the bill, I read external place. I wondered, do we have other words, territories? Territories come up frequently in international documents. But the, ter the word territory is not used in favor of the word place. I did some research. I could be wrong, but I want to toss around this idea so that I can get a response. Now, in some documents on international law, the word territory implies the involvement of sovereignty. Our current exercise should also have regard to Taiwan. Taiwan is part of our country. Taiwan is not a country after all. So if we use the word territory in our law, are we implying some sort of sovereignty for Taiwan? In that case, we would ditch the term territory. So I just want to find out the distinction between place and territory. Can the government tell us the thinking behind adopting the phrase place? We need to sort this out. For this bill, we need to have regard to the case of Taiwan. Taiwan is part of our country. We don't want to treat Taiwan as an independent country. And we need to get this point right. So. Can the government tell us the thinking behind adopting the phrase place? Just then the government has offered part of the answer that has answered part of Mr. Charles' question. Deputy Secretary, place is a broad term. Territory can be a place. So we have external place here to cover territories. If we use place, we can cover a territory. So place is broad and can cover many things. Mrs. Regina Ip. The drafting team said that place can cover territories. I have nothing against that. But territory and place both can imply sovereignty. A region can also imply sovereignty. The HKSAR is under the sovereignty of the PRC. Many territories are also part of sovereign state. Saipan, Guam, Gibraltar, 
those places are under a country. So it's all about Taiwan. Why not spell that out clearly? No need to have to phrase external place. External force is a different story. As Mr. Kitson Yang is saying, there is some inconsistency in the phrasing when you have external force and external place. So that's Mrs. Yip's comment. Any response? Let me give an example. The society's ordinance as it, as it stands distinguishes between a local political organization, a foreign political organization, and organization from Taiwan. We don't have a phrase like organization of a place under the society's ordinance. Ms. Stephanie Sill, please. We agree with Mr. Holden Chow. Territory implies sovereignty. So we go for a neutral term. No one will suggest that Hong Kong has sovereignty. We are part of China. So place is neutral. And under the import export ordinance, you also see place mutually legal aid assistance and other ordinances. We adopt the neutral phrase place. We have in mind Hong Kong status. We have also taken into account other factors. Our conclusion is that place is neutral and it can cover many different concepts, regions, countries. Ms. Kamen Khan, Chairman. A point of food for thought for the government about the term the mainland. Cap 1, Schedule 8. The Chinese version says Ming, the mainland. It reads dialogue in Chinese. But here the Chinese rendering is Noi Dei. So the government should look at the Chinese phrasing. Cap 369, 645, those two ordinances define the mainland. The NSL does not define the mainland because the NSL is a national law. So this is something for the government to think about. Schedule mm -hmm. 8 of Cap 1. Thank you. So that's a comment. Mr. Llewellyn Mui. I thank Ms. Khan for her suggestion. We will give it thought. Now on the distinction between the Chinese terms Lloyd Day and dialogue for the mainland. Cap one does not define the mainland either. So just then, someone was wondering whether we should have a definition for the mainland. Cap one does not define mainland. Thank you. Okay. Discussion just now was fruitful. I invite the administration to consider whether further amendments are required. The next term is external force. We will discuss more about the term in session six. Now we come to function. It includes a power and a duty. In the subsequent chapters, there will be provisions in relation to the discharge of duty or obligations by public officers. We will define the term in details in those chapters. Any questions? We now come to Subsection two. Subsection two explains what a case concerning national security means. It includes a a case in connection with an offense endangering national security. B a case in connection with any measures taken for or in connection with safeguarding national security, whether under the Hong Kong national security law 
this ordinance or any other law. So that goes beyond an offence. Procedural matters in relation to national security are also included. Subsection C, any proceedings in connection with the case mentioned in paragraph A or B. The term national security case would trigger particular legal proceedings under the national security law. That's why we seek to define the term clearly. Any questions from members? Deputy Secretary, please continue. Next, we are at the meaning of national security. In this ordinance or any other ordinance, a reference to national security is a reference to the status in which the state's political In this ordinance or any other ordinance, a reference to national security is a reference to the status in which the state's political regime, sovereignty, unity, and territorial integrity, the welfare of the people, sustainable economic and social developments, and other major interests of the state are relatively free from danger, inter internal or external threats, and the capability to maintain a sustained status of security. So the definition follows that under the Hong Kong national security law. So besides the Hong Kong NSL, there are other references to the term national security in other legislation. So we think we have to align the definition for this term. So we are specifying that in terms of any conflicts, the definition should, should follow the one under this law. So the Deputy Secretary explained just now why we are defining the term by way of an annex. Now I understand. The Secretaries have explained previously. In future, interpretation of the term national security would fall on our courts except for matters in relation to national authorities. If necessary, we can request for an explanation or interpretation to be issued by the National People's Congress. Is my understanding correct? Deputy Secretary, or Secretary for Justice. I said on the previous occasion, a friend of mine asked who would interpret the, who would have the final say on the interpretation of the law. Now the National People's Congress has the ultimate interpretation power to the Hong Kong national security law. For Article 23, it is a local piece of legislation. So, the final interpretation power rests with our courts. Of course, if it touches the point, the basic law, the ultimate interpretation power would rest with the National People's Congress Standing Committee. But I reiterate, there can only be one definition on how we define national security within a nation. So we have, we would definitely have to follow the country's definition for national security. A follow-up question. If one day the NPCSC issue an interpretation on the Hong Kong National Security Law Article 2, will that have an impact on Article 23, that is the Safeguarding National Security Ordinance. 
Now, this is an important matter. I mean, national security. There can only be a single unified concept for one country. Now, for binding interpretation issued by the NPCSC in terms of national security, Hong Kong, as the part of the country, must follow. Thank you for your clarification. Next, Ms. Carmen Can. Thank you, Chairman. In the meaning of national security, it says in this ordinance or any other ordinance, a reference to national security is a reference to the status in which the state's political regime and so on. When the same reference is made under various ordinances, is it a practice that we can interpret the same under the interpretation of this bill. Now, the Hong Kong National Security Law doesn't come with an official English version. So will the NUCT help facilitate the understanding of the term national security? Because this is not a common practice. After the passage of the bill, the NUCT will be removed. It is just for our reference. It will not form part of the actual ordinance. The NUCT is not common, but not unprecedented. It will also appear in the future ordinance. May I invite the Law Drafting Division to take this question? Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Khan. The practice of including a NUCT is common in many ordinances. It can facilitate understanding of the provisions in the legislation by the readers. This is a useful tool, which provides information for the reader without affecting the interpretation to the law. This is a common practice. What about my first question? It goes in this ordinance or any other ordinance. It seems that it carries the effect as in the interpretation and general clauses ordinance. It seems that you are expanding the reach of this definition to other ordinances as well. Ms. Llewellyn Mui, uh, Mr. Llewellyn Mui, please turn on Mr. Llewellyn Mui's microphone. This session goes in this ordinance or any other ordinance when a reference is made to national security, we should follow the definition in this bill. But it doesn't mean that this ordinance, this bill has an overriding effect over other ordinances. Now, the interpretation and general clauses ordinance carries the same legal effects as other ordinances under the common law system. By drafting the provision like this, it carries the effect similar to that of the interpretation and general clauses ordinance. After the passage of this bill, the safeguarding national security law or ordinance would become the go-to ordinance in safeguarding national security in Hong Kong. So I think it would be suitable to define for the term national security under this piece of dedicated legislation. Legal advisor, thank you, Chairman. A piece of information for members to consider. Concerning the usage of the sentence in this ordinance or any other ordinance, I think my colleagues would agree with me that this is not a novel practice. There are similar statements made under other ordinances. For example, CAP 212, a Criminal Procedures Ordinance, there is a session or provision concerning the 
presumption or the presumption of age that is section 106 bracket d it goes in order to presume the age of a person with a material significance which forms the evidence which forms part of the evidence the court must consider then the way of presumption would follow that under the criminal procedures ordinance the same principle would apply so that's um, how this practice is adopted in other local legislations as well Ms. Daphne Seal, allow me to elaborate. Definition of national security, and there will be an amendment. Page 133, we are going to amend Section 3 under Cap 1, Interpretation and General Clauses Ordinance. The definition for national security will be added, which goes Please refer to Section 4 of the Safeguarding National Security Ordinance. Ms. Carmen Khan, Chairman, I welcome this practice. I think it would be more appropriate to include this amendment in Cap 1. And I welcome the idea of keeping the note in the future ordinance. It will help understanding of the ordinance. If there are subsequent amendments to the definition of national security, the definition will have to be changed or am amended as well. Is that the case? Ms. Daphne Sue? That's correct. As mentioned by the Solicitor General, we have made reference to the Hong Kong National Security Law. We have replicated the definition of national security under the NSL. As mentioned by Mr. Mui, there can only be one definition for national security in a single country. So if there are other definitions uh, laid down by our country, we will make reference to them. Can we continue with Session six. Yes, it involves uh, clause clauses one one five and one four five. That is uh, page one three three of the text. Amendments to Cap One Interpretation and General Clauses Ordinance. We will add a definition for national security which is essentially clause four in the bill. Next cap, uh, session one, clause 145, page 145 of the, of the markup copy. Have you found the page yet? It should be one four eight rather. My apologies, page one hundred forty eight. One eight four or one four eight. I will give you some time to sort it out. My apologies, page 186. Just a moment, please wait for our members. In cap one, we are deleting the definition for national security under the public order ordinance and replace it with the new definition under Session 4 of the Safeguarding National Security Ordinance. 
page 186 of the markup version, clause 145. It should be clause 145, page 186 of the markup copy. Correct. Clause 145. The definition is removed to be replaced by the new definition in the bill. Any questions? Deputy Secretary, please continue. Next session, session five concerning the meaning. Sorry, just a moment. Shouldn't we go to clause six first? That is the meaning of external force. You're right, Chairman. Page six, meaning of external force. In this ordinance, external force means a government of a foreign country the authority of a region or place of an external place, a political party in an external place, any other organization in an external place that pursues political ends, an international organization, a related entity of a government, authority, political party or organization mentioned in paragraph A, B, C, D or E, or a related individual of a government, authority, political party, organization or entity mentioned in paragraph A, B, C, D, E or F. concerning related individual. It means a company that falls within either or both of the following descriptions. A1, the directors of the company are accustomed or under an obligation, whether formal or informal, to act in accordance with the directions, instructions or wishes of the government or authority. A2, the government's authority is in a position to exercise, by virtue of other factors, substantial control over the company. Or B, a body that is not a company and that falls within either or both of the following descriptions. One, the members of the executive committee, however called, of the body are accustomed or under an obligation, whether formal or informal, to act in accordance with the directions, instructions, or wishes of the government or authority. Two, the government or authority is in a position to exercise by virtue of other factors, substantial control over the body. Let's stop here. We will take questions from members. We are now at subsection 2A1 and 2 of session of course six. This is Regina Ip. I think there are lots of drafting issues here. A, a government of a foreign country. What about a the government of a state in a country? There are major states which carry a lot of political power. If you want to cover everything, then you have to say a government of a foreign country or any parts of the country. So that's a government of a foreign country or any part of that country so that you can capture the state government as well. And then coming back to the word place, well, if you say that place includes territory and region, you don't need to put any of these words in because in English it says the authority of a region or place of an external place. It sounds really peculiar to a native English speaker. The authority of an external place would be a simpler expression, a political party of an external place. That means this political party may not exist in an 
in an external place. What about a party in exile? Any other organization is an external place that pursues political, I mean, of is probably all right because we have organizations、uh, going on about in exile. E, an international organization. Right. So, since you have provided a definition for an international organization, then it follows. And then a related entity of a government authority, so and so forth. That's really broad. A related individual of a government. Again, this is broad. So,、um, for A and E, I think you can clean this up a bit, and then. Coming back to the、uh, point that we raised, that's for point E, and then F and G. Perhaps you should explain what they refer to because it sounds really broad. A related entity of a government that sounds really broad in scope. For A and D, I think that the member has made a comment. Please note her comment and see if you can improve the drafting of these two provisions. And then, E, an international organization. Again, we should put this on hold. We have discussed this previously. And then, F and G. Perhaps you can, for our benefit, explain to us what it actually means: a related entity and related individual of a government. Chairman. We're looking at the national security risks we face. Usually, the government of a foreign country may not take action to meddle with our affairs on their own. They may instead offer a financial support to some sort of entity or a organization to exert influence on Hong Kong. That is why we have included a related entity or a related individual of a government, so on and so forth, so that so that、uh, you know what we call the agent of this foreign government may be captured here. We must therefore provide these two limbs, so as to make our law effective in addressing national security risks. Chairman, how about related and under control? These are two different concepts. If you say an entity or an agent controlled by a government, that's a totally different thing than a related entity of a government. Yes. Yes.、Yeah, yes. Mr. Long. Thank you, Chairman. If I may. About the definition of a related entity or related individual under F and G, we've made reference to the relevant laws in Australia and Singapore. During consultation, this is so. Included in paragraph five point two zero of the consultation document, we've cited the relevant laws in Australia and Singapore. So first and foremost, this term "related" is a special term. It is not to be understood、uh, as a layman. Certain criteria must first be satisfied. In other words, we should refer to sub clauses two and three of clause six to find out exactly what a related entity means. Now, if we go to bracket four, you will find. A definition of a related individual of a government. That is to say, this person is accustomed or under an obligation to follow the directions, instructions of the government or a political party, etc. 
So there is a clear definition here. It is not a very generic、uh, sort of relationship. So, in other words, in the same clause, you have a clear definition. It's not to be understood in the general sense of the word. True. Right. I think that we can further discuss this point when we reach that part, Doctor Kennedy Wong. This definition is a it is very broad in scope. It tries to be all inclusive, but I wonder if、um, something is missing here. For example, international organization. That means it should be a registered organization. But on the internet, we see some dubious or even terrorist organizations not registered. There may also be organizations pursuing certain religious ideas, and as we see around the world, there are such organizations pursuing such religious ideology. So, if this organization is a terrorist organization, apparently it poses national security risk to us. I wonder if this is included here. Or is there another provision to capture these non-registered, decentralized organizations that may equally pose a risk? Yes. Now we look at this definition, and we do not distinguish the organizations that have registered with their own countries or not. Chairman, another question: What about organizations operating entirely in the cyberspace? As we all know, there are some organizations defined as terrorist organizations by many countries. They don't have any directorship. They don't operate in any physical location. They simply exist in the cyberspace. So how? Are they captured here?、Uh, yes, please explain, Chairman. Doctor Wong's question is on whether a certain organization can operate singly in the cyberspace. Well, I think we need to have regard to the actual circumstances in order to. Have an existence on the internet. There should be somebody accessing the internet. Perhaps an office bearer of the organization may be relying on the internet to hold meetings and to put and for members to put their heads together and decide on the action. Still, these members may use a certain physical location as their base. I don't think an organization can simply exist in virtual reality. There must be a physical human being having control over this organization. Dr. Kennedy Wong also asked a question on a terrorist organization. I mean, it depends. There are some.、Um, Terrorist organizations such, such as the Islamic State, it is operating on such a scale as to exert control over certain areas in the Middle East is almost akin to a government, and in such a circumstance, it should fall under point B, the authority of a regional place of an external place. Now, if This is an organization pursuing a certain political goal. Then, this is captured in point D. Chairman, I just hope that、uh, a clearer definition can be provided for this、uh, term, organization. Mr. Chen Xiuhong.
external force means and then a and b i think the way these are drafted it's quite clumsy a government of a foreign country and then the authority of a region or place of an external place um, well it's just a drafting issue i think you can put these two under the same bullet point and then how do you tell d from e because d refers to any other organization in an external place that pursues political ends and then e an international organization when we discussed the definition of an international organization earlier i pointed out that there are organizations with i mean receiving funding from governments or um, under the control of a government but this organization may not pursue any political end. It operates solely on a commercial basis. So will such an organization be included in point D? If you say external force, it carries a negative connotation. Now, this bill targets organizations that pose uh, organizations that pose a national security risk. There are organizations having dealings with other external organizations um, under the control of a foreign government, and they may be concerned. According to the government's explanation earlier, an international organization is not to be construed as something bad. It's neutral. And now you've provided all the bullet points A to G, that seems to capture every kind of organization or individual. Even a related entity or related individual may be included. So I want an explanation on exactly what organizations you're going after. And then bracket two, about the definition of external force, A, Roman numeral two, the government or authority is in a position to exercise, by virtue of other factors, substantial control over the company. Now, are you suggesting that, um, say, perhaps this organization may not be directly managed by the government? The government may be higher up in the hierarchy. So for Roman numeral two, Shouldn't you um, make it clear that um, as long as the government exists in the hierarchy and that will act according to the directions, instructions of the government or, or authority? You've asked three questions. Perhaps you can just answer two of them and let them wait for another round. For external force and then under it a to g let me explain what they're about a government of a foreign country i think that is very clear is a government established under normal circumstances and then b the authority of a region or place of an external place and mrs ib just now referred to a state government We use the term authority to mean the organ having control over the place. Now, not so much a government, but an administration. And then for the expression place of an external place, it captures a very wide area. Let's say for a place that is not a country, that is a region, perhaps, by so um, drafting this provision, we can capture the authority having control of this place. And then C, I think it's very clear, political party in an external place. D, any other organization? Well, I, in fact, I think you don't need to go through them one by one. You just answer his question on D and E. D means 
an organization pursuing political ends which is not a political party. While this is to be determined according to the actual circumstances, we need to consider the articles of associations and the objective of this organization. Even if it's called a political party, uh, we cannot then decide whether it is an organization that pursues political ends. It depends on the actual circumstances. And then E, an international organization. We earlier discussed this term. This is a neutral term. We should consider, for example, whether the organization includes a member of a country. And we also explained that, in fact, in English, the word is members, not one member. And the, if there are members from one country, it can be regarded as an international organization. Next, Reverend Canon Peter Kuhn. Point D, political ends. That's um, the term used in English. Will you consider using the word means instead of ends? and then an international organization. Are you suggesting that the Red Cross should be captured as well here? Because it is an international organization. It's a matter of perception. Well, I understand you don't want to miss anything out, but the point is if you make a list of it from A to G, then at a glance, an international organization may include international aid or even religious groups. So perhaps uh, you can enlighten me on this point, T.S. An international organization is a neutral and commonly used term. Well, we just now explained what organizations we mean to capture by using the term international organization. We find this expression appropriate. In fact, external force is just an expression. We need to go on and decide whether this organization exerts control over so and so. And then we need to consider the rest of the circumstances. We don't think the way this is drafted will in any way um, affect the situation. If this is an organization posing national security threat to Hong Kong, then it falls under this meaning. Otherwise, it should not have any impact at all. So that's the clarity we're looking for. A body pursues political ends or a body is an international organization. That per se will not be caught by our law. It has to be coupled with actions in breach of the law, and then we will go after them. Mr. Jeffrey Lam, my question is about C, political party. Is it too narrow? Would political organization be better? The Liberal Party is a party, but G19 is not a part, it's not called a party. So can we use a broader term under C to cover more bodies. Now, any other organization in an external place that pursues political ends, but not everybody tells you they have political ends. They may be after money and they have money and then they exercise control. So can we have a clear definition under D? Now I turn to E, international organizations. Is the International Chamber of Commerce an international organization? What sort of international organization? Can we be clearer? Hong Kong residents may go overseas. They do all kinds of nasty things. Do they count as external forces? We need more clarity here. 
The people I just described don't work for foreign governments, but they have close ties with foreign governments. These people may get funding, subsidies, or political asylum from foreign governments. We need to deal with this sort of people. Chairman, can the government address the points I just raised? You conflated several points. The fifth point in the bill covers your concerns about subsidies and funding, but we can hear from the government first. The DS, please. Mr. Lam's first question. What if a political party does not call itself as a part a party? Now we have bracket D. Any other organization in an external place pursuing political ends. So even a body without a label party will be caught. My question also turns on the definition of political ends. We need a flexible definition. And then we look at the mission, the nature of every body. And then we decide whether a body counts as something we catch in the law. We need flexibility rather than rigidity. We're not worried about inadvertent breaches. You need a body from an external place that engages in certain behavior and only then we catch them. So now we have struck a good balance. Now, the scenario where Hong Kong residents go overseas, they get paid by foreign governments. This will likely be caught. Say these people take instructions from foreign governments that will fall under 62A1. Control can be exercised through money. That would be 262A Roman numeral 2. So the scenarios raised by Mr. Jeff Willem are all caught by the provision here. What about international organizations? You have a very broad definition here. Anything, any organization international in nature counts as an international organization. It's a broad concept, but there are parameters. This has to be an organization with members from other places or entities from other places. And only then that body counts as an international organization. So we do have some parameters when it comes to what counts as an international organization. Next, Mr. Stanley M. Chairman, our discussion. Is too much hung up over the items here, A through G. There may be cases that fall through the cracks. They're not caught by A through G. Someone comes to stir up trouble, they can come in any form or shape. So external forces should be any organized form of forces, external forces. We target the criminality committed by such forces. You can have an even longer list covering a hundred kinds of cases. Shouldn't we be smarter in how we define external forces? So any organized forces, external in nature. So it's about being organized in nature. So we don't catch disorganized forces. Is that the case? You can have an NGO, a green group, or a company. They can count as external forces. As the DS said, external forces can come in many forms and shapes. You cannot have an exhaustive list. That's Mr. M's suggestion, DS. Now, of course, we want to 
be as comprehensive as we can in external forces. But the more comprehensive you want it to be, the more you miss. Can you let the government respond to your question first, Mr. Mm. We are a common law jurisdiction. We need certainty in our law. When we are too broad in the provisions, then we will compromise certainty and that will not be proper. So we strike a balance between certainty and comprehensiveness. So we base our provision on what we have been through, what we have observed. We think it through. We want to cover the threats we have seen. For every item here, our team has thought through every item here to cover the threats we have seen or threats we for we can foresee. And then we came up with this list. Chairman, a follow-up question. Some so-called NGOs or funds, will they be covered? Funds or foundations, will they be covered here? I look beyond the nature of a body. I look at the actions of a body. 6 to 8, for example. The description here on what counts as a related entity. We look beyond the nature of the entity. We look at the tie between the related entity and an external force. We look at the tie rather than the nature. And then we can take a broad approach that also offers certainty at the same time. And then we can achieve better legal certainty. Mr. Holden Chow. Thank you, Chairman. A suggestion. So the approach now about the definition of external forces is that we're just looking at the definition. There is an offense, external interference. Shouldn't we look at external forces in the context of external interference? We define external forces because of the offense of external interference, endangering national security. There is improper means, intimidation, cajoling, etc. We should first discuss external interference, and then we come back to the definition of external forces. I get it. When members look at external forces as a term on its own, the term looks broad. It covers foreign bodies, it covers business bodies, everything. But for the offense to kick in, you need to, you need to see improper means and interference in Hong Kong. If you look at the definition alone, of course, people get alarmed. So I have a suggestion. Let's get right to part six. I'm not trying to bend the rules. But my point is, when you discuss this definitions alone, you give rise to misconceptions. So let's get to part six. Let's talk about the offense of external interference, what counts as inter external interference, improper means endangering national security, and then we come back to the definition of external forces. We talk about external forces in isolation. As long as there is no improper means, no interference, no endangering of national security, and we're all fine. But when we zero in on external forces, who's, who counts and who doesn't count business bodies, and then people get alarmed because we leave out the rest of the context. So why not we jump to part six? I get your point, Mr. Chow. By the time you get to part six, you have to backtrack to the definition. Your approach will cause even greater confusion. When we get to part six, we can revisit the definition. That's fine. we're looking at whether the definition makes sense. That's our first goal.
we are looking not just at the provision of this part, we need to scrutinize the entire bill. We will get to the latter part of the bill. 6, 1, F and G. We haven't even got to 6, 1, 3 and 4. We haven't got to related entities, etc. The definition is there under sub clauses 3 and 4. The explanation is clear enough. We need to take a holistic view. We don't look at the local, we, look, we take a global view of the bill. Let's look, take a holistic view. Jumping around will make things even more confusing. So I disagree with you on that point. Chairman, at least we're now on the same page. We take a global view. Thank you. Mrs. Regina Epp. Chairman, I agree with Mr. Holden Chow. For these definitions, external force, external organization, we should move these definitions to the part on external interference. That would work better. Otherwise, we create misunderstanding. ICC, International Chamber of Commerce, UN bodies, the Red Cross, people think that we talk to these bodies and then we break the law. Now I come back to the point of related entity, related individual. These terms are from Australian and Singaporean laws. We need the paragraph and chapter. We need the source as chapter and verse. In Australia, they have the law, foreign interference scheme, transparency scheme ordinance or act. In Australia, the point is about transparency. Singapore is different. This, case is different in Australia and Singapore. We cannot just replicate what's in Singaporean and Australian law. Now, there is the subclause to related entity. There is definition. It, the entity has to take instructions. So you should have a phrase that says subject to paragraph two. Otherwise, people see what you have here does the Australian Business Chamber or US Ch Business Chamber count? Now there are textual issues, a government of a foreign country. So a state government should be excluded. Now you can say you can cover that under B, authority of a region or place of an external place. So it's a place, not a country. Just then, Mr. Jeffrey Lamb said, a political body may operate outside the country. In the UK, there are people trying to run Hong Kong Independence Party, etc. You can simply say of an external place rather than in. So we should change a, a government, common or authority or agency of a foreign country or any part of a foreign country, then you can cover everything. Authority, agency, you cover everything of a foreign country. Now, on related entity, it's too broad. You need to put that, qualify that under subclause two. And I agree with Holden. When, if these terms come up only in relation to interference, you should put the definition nearer the part on interference, not up front. Mr. Chen Siu Hong shares this view too. Otherwise, we will give rise to major misunderstanding. So this is about foreign government authority of an external place. Just then we have heard suggestions. The government said it would consider those views. Now, another point was raised about international organization. I agree with Mr. Lai Tong Kwok and Chen Siu Hong on the point. When we discuss the relevant offenses, we can revisit the definition of an international organization. We can revisit this point. We need to take it one step at a time. First, we 
examine the definition to see whether there are major issues. And then when we get to the offenses, we can revisit the definition of international organizations. This will be the more prudent approach. Mrs. Regina, if with your permission, C, international organization, it does not include the European Union. The EU insists it is not an international organization. The EU styles itself as a supranational organization. It's real. EU papers call the EU a supranational organization. So when we phrase our law like this, we will miss the EU. So does international cover supranational? In our definition, we will cover the EU. So the labels other places adopt have little to do with our definition. Sorry, Chairman, just to add a point. We adopt the phrase external force. This phrase comes in when we discuss external interference, but in other offenses, this phrase also matters. So when someone commits an offense and this culprit colludes with external forces in committing the offense. So that will be in an aggravating factor, attracting stiffer penalties. So external force matters, not just for external interference, but also for other offenses. Deputy Secretary, you are getting ahead of yourself. You leave members even more confused than they already are. And then this will drag on indefinitely. So why not we revisit the definition when we get to those offenses? Deputy Chairman, I echo the questions from the two members from the DAB. Chairman, you discussed the procedure, the approach we would take. I respect that remark, but Mr. Holden Chow made a point about the perception of the public. And I invite Mr. Chris Tang, the leader of the rebuttal team, to take note. When someone focuses on our discussion over the last half of an hour, the discussion about business chambers, NGOs, And then people can smear our work by taking things out of context. And this point was raised by Mrs. Regina Ip, so I invite the Secretary for Security to take note of this point. Dr. Kennedy Wong made another point. External forces, international organizations, the government stresses that we have to focus on entities registered somewhere. But let's bear in mind, the chief executive said that we need to show foresight. Let's bear in mind the changing times. Some organizations don't have a place of registration. Some organizations exist purely in the cyberspace. They have an online presence and that's all. From the 2019 riots, we have learned that some organizations exist on certain apps. They don't have a physical presence. Now, overseas, for ideological reasons, those forces try to hurt our national security through certain people. And our law only targets organizations with a physical presence registered somewhere, then our law would end up falling behind the times and that would become a loophole. So I invite the government to consider ways to deal with organizations with purely an online presence. But these bodies are overseas and they do have the capability to undermine our national security. Secretary, please. Could we take note of the members' views and seek to improve the provisions? Mr. Kissing Yang, 
Thank you. I share Mr. Gary Chen's view. According to the existing definition, it doesn't catch the online pl platforms. They aren't companies, they aren't entities. entities. If it is just a platform on Telegram, you can't catch them because there is no, they are not a physical entity, which you consider including the reference to a platform, an online platform existing in virtual, in the virtual space as well. Secretary, what do you think? I think that is essentially the same as the deputy chairman's view. We will consider it together. Any other question? Please continue. Deputy Secretary. Chairman, we now come to paragraph F on the external force. That is a political party in an external place. The reference to a related entity of a political party in an external place. Part A, a company that falls within either or both of the following descriptions. One, the directors of the company are accustomed or under an obligation, whether formal or informal, to act in accordance with the directions, instructions, or wishes of the organization. Two, the organization is in a position to exercise, by virtue of other factors, substantial control over the company. So similar to the previous provision, it refers to a non-incorporated entity that is not a, a body that is not a company. It must follow the one of the two descriptions. One, the members of the executive committee, however called of the body, are accustomed or under an obligation, whether formal or informal, to act in accordance with the directions, instructions, or wishes of the organization. Or two, the organization is in a position to exercise, by virtue of other factors, substantial control over the body. Or C, a body that falls within the following description, the law, constitution, rules, or other governing documents, by which the body is constituted, or according to which the body operates, contain either or both of the following requirements. One, a director, senior officer, or employee of the body is required to be a member of the organization. And two, any part of the body is required to constitute a part, however called, of the organization. So there are three scenarios. under which a company would be defined as a related entity of a political party. Paragraph 4 refers to the definition of external force falling within the definition of a related individual of a government, authority, political party, and so on. There are two scenarios. One, the individual is accustomed or under an obligation, whether formal or informal, to act in accordance with the directions, instructions, or wishes of the government, authority, and so on. Or two, the government, authority, political party, organization, or entity is in a position to exercise, by virtue of other factors, substantial control over the individual. Then the individual would be counted as a related individual. Concerning the meaning of six, we will have a more detailed discussion when we come to the related offense. So any more question? Legal advisor. Please switch on the legal advisor's microphone. Thank you, Chairman. Just a brief comment. The broad discussion also mentioned this. In two, three, and four, there are a test on whether an entity or an individual is related to a government. So besides accustomed or under an obligation to act in accordance with the direction, the instructions or wishes of the organization, there is also the clause by virtue of other factors.
So can the government clarify what it means by virtue of other factors, substantial control has been exercised by the government on the organization. To what extent does substantial control means and what does it mean by what does it mean by other factors? So according to the two paragraphs, I think the principle is as follows. Paragraph A specifies scenarios where a, an entity is acting under the directions, instructions, or wishes of the organization under an obligation. Paragraph B refers to other factors. The scope is broader. So that entity is or individual is not acting under an obligation in accordance with the directions, instructions, or wishes of the organization. But by virtue of other factors, the organization is exercising substantial control over the body. So the focus is on control. By whatever means, if an organization exercises substantial control over the body, then it would count. Legal advisor, thank you. The crucial factor here is the power of control. So can the government give us an example on what kind of control do you have in mind? In a company's context, the power of control would stem from voting, a rise of voting. Now a brief, exam now a brief example. Money always counts. Foreign governments would control, would exercise control over organization by way of distribution of subsidies. According to media reports, a lot of bodies with a relationship with foreign governments receive money from external forces, including foreign governments, for them to act in accordance with their wishes. Mr. Jeffrey Lam, Chairman, members of the Executive Committee or board di or directors are mentioned here. There are many kinds of directors, executive directors, non-executive directors, or even shadow directors. In the case of shadow directors, it refers to those without a physical presence, but they are the people calling the shots behind the scene. And not just directors, what about senior executive management? Should they also be covered? Senior executive members may know more about the secrets in the company more so than the directors. We have considered what Mr. Jeffrey Lam mentioned. We are dealing with that scenario by the clause by virtue of other factors. Of course, if it is a member of the executive committee, then of course the, the extent of control would be more substantial. But there are other factors where the organization can exercise control over an organization over the body. Shouldn't we make reference to the company's ordinance? So should we have a registration system for board of directors and so on? Mr. Leung? We are talking about external force here. I think Mr. Jeffrey means that under our company's ordinance and also SFC ordinance and so on, there are lots of definitions for directors as well as associated persons. But here we are talking about external forces. No matter how you call the directors, shadow directors or so on, 
in these foreign countries, you have to look beyond our own the definition in our own legislation. So we rely heavily on the clause by virtue of other factors. For entity which are not companies, if you look at 2B1, after the term executive committee, we added the clause however called. So we are trying to make it as broad as, as general as possible to cover all the scenarios, including those mentioned by Mr. Jeffrey Lam. Mr. Chen Xiu Hong, thank you, Chairman. I asked a similar question just now, but I would like to seek another explanation from the government. I wonder what your intention is. In brackets 2A, it says, if the directors of the company are accustomed or under an obligation, whether formal or informal, to act in accordance with the directions, instructions, or wishes of the organization. Well, under some scenarios, the directions don't come directly from the government. There may be some middleman. The entity may be managed by another entity which receive orders from the government. Through the middleman, the same effect is achieved. That is, the body would act in accordance with the directions issued by the foreign government. So in Roman numeral two, the key word is by the organization is in a position to exercise by virtue of other factors, substantial control over the body. Is that the crucial part? That's also our understanding. With the clause by virtue of other factors, as long as there is a substantial control exercised by the organization, then it counts. We now come to number seven, clause seven. What about clause five? Yes, sorry, clause five. We now come back to the meaning of colluding with external force. For the purposes of an offense under, under this ordinance, a person colludes with an external force to do an act if one or more of the following circumstances exist. There are five scenarios. One, the person participates in an activity planned or otherwise led by an external force, and the act is an act that the person's participation in the activity involves. B, the person does the act on behalf of an external force. C, the person does the act in cooperation with an external force. D, the person does the act under the control, supervision, or direction of, or on request by an external force. E, the person does the act with the financial contributions or the support by other means of an external force. I want to emphasize one point. There is the label of collusion with external force. But the act itself does not constitute an offense. There must be other actus reus or criminal actions for the offense to kick in. So you mean that another act, another criminal actions must be in existence for it to count. So colluding with external force simply means acting together with the external force. For the offense to kick in, you have to refer to the actual activities described in the offense. Mr. Chen Xiu Hong, I thank the Deputy Secretary for her explanation. That's exactly my worry. The word here is colluding. But if you look at scenarios A to D, None of these are criminal actions. These are just normal business dealings. But by using the word collusion, it causes concern. 
So when we come to the relevance parts of the offenses, we have to come back to clause five to see whether we can use a better word in describing these actions. And all the five scenarios seem to be direct interactions. But what about indirect dealings? If there is indirect involvement in these activities, what do you think? Deputy Secretary, in setting the parameter, we have struck a balance. We would also be worried if we set the scope too broadly. We may catch people unwittingly. So we would look at the results of the activities. It seems very direct. For cases where indirect involvement is the subject, then we would look at the results. If the results is if the results are there, then they would count. Mr. Kissing Yang, what if a person is acting under the duress of an external force in doing these things? Will they be caught? Deputy Secretary, concerning acting under duress, that is a specific concept under the criminal ordinance. That is a person commits a criminal activity with a threat to his or her life. This is a common law concept, excluding murder and treason. So for these scenarios, it would not be appropriate if we include action under duress as well. You use the word control. So does that cover threats or duress as well? If you look at other jurisdictions, many people are acting in collusion with external forces to cause risk to our country with the rest to themselves or their family members. So does control include actions committed under the arrest? Secretary, I will attempt the question and I ask Paul to supplement me. Now, for a defense of action under the arrest, the defendants have to have the burden of proof. I think the member's question is in con is in concern of the worries that someone may be acting under duress in collusion with external force. Or under the common law system, one must have the mens rea or acting knowingly or with options or deliberately to commit the act. Now, we have specified that the defendant must have a choice in doing so. Now, when someone acts under duress and committed offense, it may be a matter of concern. So the point here is that the person does have a choice. That's the spirit of the law. I hope I have answered your question. Yes, I suppose you've answered the question, right? Next, Mr. Holden Chow. Thank you, Chairman. I thank Deputy Secretary for clearing this up. Now, at the first glance, colluding with external force. Now, I'm slightly concerned that this is a separate offence. But uh, according to the administration's explanation, the proper offence is external interference. And here, the word used is colluding. 
Now, this is a point on diction, and I'm looking at points D and E of colluding with external force. The act under the control, supervision, or direction of or on request by an external force contributions to support by other means of an external force. Now, here, and I'm comparing this with the Hong Kong national security law, especially colluding with external forces. And it seems that uh, these expressions are similar, albeit not identical. Article 29 of the Hong Kong NSL apparently refers to an offence of colluding with an external force and then there are clear criteria, uh, such as uh, waging a war against the state or inviting other countries to impose a sanction on us. So it's very clear for the Hong Kong NSL. Here, for colluding with external force, it is said that, for example, um, this person doesn't act with a financial contribution to support of an external force. I would just want to make sure that these two are aligned. These two seem similar. Law Drafting Division, Mr. Long. If I may be of assistance, clause five, colluding with external force, and also comparing this with the offense of colluding with an external force, endangering national security under the Hong Kong NSL, I say that these two are not um, directly related. Instead, in drawing up this clause, we made reference to the National Security Act of 2023 in the United Kingdom and then also uh, offences of espionage and external interference in Australia. And we've incorporated some of these elements here. The heading is colluding with external force. As we go on, uh, you will find that by colluding with external forces, we're referring to um, acts of, say, espionage, colluding with external forces to interfere with our affairs, such as publishing or issuing seditious publication but there is no direct correlation with uh, Article 29 of the Hong Kong NSL. Chairman, do allow me to respond to that. Thank you for your explanation. Collusion under Hong Kong NSL comes with a clear definition. According to the administration's explanation here, this clause seeks to provide further interpretation to the proper offenses prescribed later on, such as external interference. For the act of actual collusion, one should refer to Article 29 of Hong Kong NSL instead of referring to this clause. Am I right? I'd say that uh, by and large, Mr. Chow, this observation is right. Now, in fact, Article 29 refers to collusion. This is just a label, the so-called uh, the title of the offense. In fact, as far as the elements of the offense under Article 29 of the Hong Kong NSL, there is no such expression collusion. It just exists in the heading. Uh, there are four members waiting to speak. I will extend this meeting until four members have spoken. Mr. Lai Tong Kwok. A very simple point, clause five, for the purposes of an offense. Now, this is expressly provided. One understands very easily that this bit involves an offense. Otherwise, if there is no offense, we don't need to discuss any further. 
we spent a lot of time on discussing the meaning of external force. I mean, we went down the rabbit hole. In fact, you should uh, adopt the same expression for the purposes of an offense in the other parts uh, of the uh, bill, such as in this ordinance or any other ordinance. For clarity's sake, yes. Yes, we'll go back and consider this suggestion. Dr. Loi Kwok. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I think we discussed at length what external force means. And I think this is similar to our discussion on an international organization. Now we realize that the terms international organization and external force are neutral, but unfortunately, with the heading colluding with external force, uh, one easily associates the external force with um, something bad. Yeah, yes, indeed, it's painted in a negative, in a bad light. And then when you further define external force in the expression colluding with external force, then we can't help but um, have this feeling that uh, this must be something fishy, something bad. But in fact, external force is a neutral term. By such a drafting style, it gives a perception that, or even misunderstanding, that this must be something bad. So perhaps you should improve the paragraphing or drafting of this part to address this concern. Otherwise, one can easily distort what it means here. We're not suggesting that um, these should be prohibited. Do go back and uh, give it a thought. If there is no intention of pegging this to the Hong Kong NSL, please consider redrafting this bit. I'd like to raise two points about the meaning here. Meaning of colluding with external force, and I see bullet points A to E at the same time. Clause 52, again, we have the meaning of colluding with an external force or collaborating with, an, with external force. If so, why do we have different wordings? One colluding, the other collaborating. My other question is this. Well, uh, it's often reported that some individuals may request um, external forces to impose sanction on us. So does the word request fall under Clause 5 or Clause 52, colluding or collaborating with external force? Well, Clause 52 provides a different context. We will go to that part later in greater detail. Here, when we phrase it colluding with external force, we're referring to certain offenses, and the X means acts and activities endangering national security. When it comes to collaborating with external force in Clause 52, the context is different. The external force may not involve, uh, may not be involved in an unlawful act, and that is why, in Clause Fifty Two, we have refrained from using a negative word, collusion, or colluding, with. 
right? Is that how you consider this? Since this is not an offence provision, and that you need to consider further elements um, or the other limbs of the offence, that is why you use the term colluding with. What about somebody requesting external forces to do certain acts on our country? Article 29 of the Hong Kong NSL captures the situation. Requesting another country or an external organization to impose sanction and also perform a series of acts. Article 22 is an offense provision. It sets the backdrop of this offense. Here, we're only describing the relationship of this organization with an external force, external government. So this is a different scenario. So does this clause capture the request scenario? Indeed, the request may have been made, but after making this request, will this person or this organization be controlled by this external force or foreign government? So we're talking about the different, uh, the varying scenarios that follows the request. It may eventually be uh, caught by this clause. Dr. Kennedy Wong. Thank you, Chairman. I agree with you and other members. Just at a glance, colluding, colluding with external force seems to be a grave offence. It turns out not to be an offence. We practice common law in Hong Kong, and we have aiding and abetting in a criminal law system is well established by case law and apparently these are offenses now you refer to the other act collaborating with external force how about using the traditional terms aiding and abetting wouldn't it be easy to understand yes well i think this is more than just aiding and abetting. If you take a look at points A to E, you will find the different scenarios of collaborate collaboration. So aiding and abetting may only cover some of the scenarios mentioned. They may not be uh, sufficient in dealing with what we're trying to to uh, capture. Well, um, now we have aiding and abetting in the statute law as well. Can you incorporate these into this bill as well to help us understand it better? Indeed, we have um, new jargons emerging. Um, and, and in fact, I'm still learning these new terms like collusion or colluding. This is seldom used in the past. In fact, the general offense aiding and abetting already applies here. And that is why it's not spelled out in the bill. If there are no other questions, let's end the session of class by class scrutiny here. At 9 tomorrow morning, we'll start the third session. Members, may I draw your attention to the schedule? There will be meetings tomorrow and uh, the following day. I suppose uh, the Secretariat already issued a notice to members setting out the uh, place of the meeting, that is conference room one. Can we leave the papers here? Yes, we can lock the door. Yes, thank you. May I have an attendance list? We don't have one. I don't know what to call the government officials. 
who is the law draftman. Please distribute the attendance list to members. Anything else? Anything under AOB? If not, then thank you everyone for attending. Meetings adjourned.